Welcome to the Forbes Town Hall, often known as the White House of the West. Our building was completed in 1891 and had its formal opening to great pageantry on the 28th of November of that same year. A report of the event in the Sydney Mail describes some of those festivities. The day was proclaimed a public holiday. Festoons of Chinese lanterns which were lighted in the evening were used as decorations in Victoria Square. About 10am, hundreds of well-dressed people assembled in the hall and the proceedings were commenced by an overture march from Wagner's Tannhauser played by Professor Guidobono of Sydney, which was greeted by rapturous applause. This was followed by a series of speeches from local dignitaries and the town hall declared open. <laughs> the concept for the new town hall was passed by council in September 1889 and the Sydney Mail had this to say about it. Our local municipal council, after having one of the best sites in town unoccupied for years, are at last calling for design with the view of erecting a town hall. Hitherto, the town has had to depend on the hotel keepers for the supply of a hall when one has been wanted for any public purposes. Our civic fathers, with commendable wisdom, have decided that such a state of things shall exist no longer. The intermissions of public entertainments and the proximity of public house bars are responsible for many of our young men falling into bad habits. It is certainly good to know that the future sobriety of both our councillors and populace was one of the deciding factors for the Town Hall. Competitive designs for the building were invited in September 1889 and out of 20 submissions the winner was announced in December the same year. Gordon McKinnon of Parramatta was the recipient with Mr E. Thompson of the City Architects Department, Sydney, the runner-up. McKinnon's other designs include the Parramatta Park Gatehouse and town halls in Inverell, Launceston and Albury. It was originally estimated that the new building would cost between £2,000 and £3,000. In May 1890, the plans were referred back to Mr McKinnon as the proposed costs were much more than anticipated. This must have been resolved and the building went ahead, being built between 1890 and 1891 by builder T. F. Rowe. Final cost according to government records, was £5,471, 18 shillings and 5 pence. Ever since its completion, our hall has been the social hub of Forbes, from formal balls to bush dances, receptions and concerts. Before social media, the town hall was the place for couples to meet, socialise and court. Our long-running Estedford is also an important annual event that brings together locals and also those from surrounding districts. Many well-known performers, politicians and preachers have graced the stage. These include early rock and roll artists and of course Dame Nellie Melba who performed here in 1909. The official capacity of the hall now is 300, but Melba had 700 people crammed in, with 300 outside listening in the pouring rain. Of course, locals have also trodden the stage with theatrical and concert performances as well. The stage facilities are recognised as being first class. The area surrounding our town hall has also been used for community events and celebrations. During World War I, the Boomerang Recruitment March paused to have their photograph taken on the steps. At the end of the war, a tin can band was photographed in the same spot. Here is how the Forbes Advocate of Friday, November the 15th, 1918 described the event. 
The news of the end of the war came through to Forbes at about 9.30 last night and the celebrations began. One young cock sparrow with a dish and a stick created a terrific din. This was the signal to other youngsters to do likewise and in a short space of time every tin dish in the town seems to have been commandeered. The area bordering Victoria Park on the eastern side is also utilised for public gatherings and performance. Carnivals to raise funds for the ambulance service were a regular occurrence in the early days, along with services at the Cenotaph for Anzac Day and other occasions. During floods and other disasters, this area has become the landing spot for rescue helicopters. The first of these was in 1952 and created a unique experience for locals who had never seen such an aircraft. Let me leave you with an interesting tale from a local we recorded many years ago. Mr Reg Baldock describes how his father had to replace the flagpole on the top of the town hall in the early 1900s. The only trouble was that they forgot to put the wire for the flag through the pulley. With typical Forbes ingenuity, his father overcame the problem. The flagpole was made out of Oregon and rotted a fair bit and my father had the contract to replace it. The pole is a lot longer than one would imagine, probably 12 or 14 foot high. But when it was erected, the only thing that was missing was the wire that pulled the flag wasn't connected. So Freddie Gulagong, Dad went and seen him and he volunteered to climb up the pole and hook the wire through the loop for 10 shillings. With a good big audience he climbed the pole, put the wire through and Dad gave him a pound. 